Well, good morning. I hope that uh, you're doing well. Uh, I know most of you are at home watching this right now, and uh, I don't know what time it is for you, but for me it is uh, 11.49, so we're still in the morning time. We're almost to, uh, to afternoon. Uh, but I hope that this week has been a great week for you as uh, you've get, kind of been getting used to uh, the new normal for us, uh, at least for this time and period. You know, uh, right now with the hardship that's going on, I hear a lot of people talking about... Uh, the worst days, right? The worst days in history. And, and I hear that statement that this is the worst it's ever been frequently. And the statement always makes me really uncomfortable. I, I know that terrible things take place all the time, and I, I know that the coronavirus is a terrible thing. But when we look back over history, and we look back over thousands and thousands of years, uh, can we really say that it's worse now than it's ever been before? I think of the Dark Ages. I think of the Crusades when it was the church itself that was going out and slaughtering people and killing them. I think about the Holocaust. I think about the pre-Reformation period in which the true gospel wasn't going forth. They were going around selling salvation, which is so far from the gospel. And that's what the church was offering to sinners I think of the terrible things that were done to African Americans in this country and the stories that we hear about how uh, they were killed. Uh, Emmett Teal is a a story that that just pops out to me. A a little African American uh, teenager who who whistled at a white girl and was brutally murdered and and disfigured in such a terrible way that his mom actually had an open, open casket for everyone to see. And I think of these terrible things and I ask myself, can we truly say that it's the worst it's ever been today. Then I ask myself, what is the absolute worst day in history? Can we determine what that day is? Not necessarily the worst time period, but can we determine what the worst day in all of history truly is? What is the absolute worst injustice that this world has ever experienced? And I believe that I know the answer to that question. I'm going to make an argument to you that it was the day that the only perfect man, the only truly good man, the day that the very Son of God was tortured and crucified. If there ever was an injustice, it was this day. In order to make this claim, we must believe that Jesus truly was perfect, that He was truly Good, and that He was truly the Son of God, is truly the Son of God. And this morning, I want us to dig deeply into God's Word and to see four things that accompany Jesus' crucifixion that can help us determine whether that was truly the case. We're getting ready for Easter. Time is flying by. We're here in April. And next week, we'll celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, one of the greatest days of rejoicing for us. But this week, we focus on the world's worst day, the worst day in history, the crucifixion of Christ. And I want us to see four things that took place that day that point to the fact that Jesus truly is the Son of God, that He truly is the Messiah, that He truly was who He claimed to be. So if you would turn to Matthew chapter 27, I'm going to read for you verses 27 uh, through 54. And we're really going to focus in on 45 to 54 uh, later on. But I want you to see 27 uh, through 44 because it gives some context and it kind of shows us some, some really key things about, about what people believe about God and what He does for people He loves. And then we're going to see in verses 45 to 54 that the one He loves the most, His perfect Son, He was willing to let suffer. He was willing to let die for His good, for for the Father's purpose, for His glory. And I want you to see that that's actually a good thing. All right? So read with me. This is Matthew chapter 27, verses 27 to 54. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before Him. And they stripped Him, this is Jesus, and they put a scarlet robe on Him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and they put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him, 
And they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and they put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But he, when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Notice what the stipulation is for them to believe that He is the Son of God, that He must save Himself, that He must come down from the cross. That's the requirement. So also the chief priests and the scribes and elders mocked Him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save Himself. He is the King of Israel. Let Him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in Him again. If he comes down from the cross, we will believe in him. Look at this claim, verse 43. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. Making the claim that if God truly loves his son, if he's truly the son of God, that God will deliver him from this crucifixion. For he said, I am the son of God. Verse 44, and the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now, from the sixth hour, that's 12 o'clock noon our time, from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. That's about 3 p.m. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and he took a sponge and filled it with sour wine. He put it on a reed and he gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook. And the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, as we look over the account of your son Jesus and his death, his crucifixion, God, it's sorrowful to think of what he had to endure on that cross and even before the cross as he's beaten, as he's mocked, as he's dressed up like a toy doll for us. And God, as we see the claims that if he's truly the son of God, you'll let him off the cross. If, if he's truly the son of God, he'll come down himself. God, it hurts us to know that he did have the authority. And surely you, our father, had the authority to pull him down from there. But it was your great love that kept him there on the cross. Your great love for us. Father, we thank you for that love. Father, we come before your word today asking you to teach us, asking you to grow us, asking you to to cause our hearts to repent, to turn from our sin, to trust in you, to bring you glory and praise, to give these lives up for your name's sake, for your kingdom to come. And God, we pray just that, that your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, in verses 27 through 44, we see Jesus being mocked. We see him being beaten. We see him spit on. We see him stripped. 
And we see the claim in verse 43, let God deliver him now if he desires him. Isn't that how we think today a lot of times? If God loves me, he will deliver me from the trials, from the hardship, hardships of this life. And yet what I would suggest to you is that it's God's love that allows us to go through the hardships of this life. It's the hardships that draw us nearer to him. It's the hardships that grow us to be more like Christ. It is God's love that allows us to go through the hardest things. And as Jesus hung on the cross and those watching said, surely if God loves him, he'll come down. The demonstration of the Father's love was that he allowed Jesus to endure the worst, most painful, worst day in all of history, the, the worst injustice of all time. And you know what? Jesus was rewarded for what he did on that cross. We'll see that next week as we celebrate Easter. But I want you to think in your life, do you think like that? Do you think if God really loves me, he's going to spare me from hardship, from trial? And then I'd ask you if you believe that, is that what we see with his own son, Jesus Christ? I want to point you to four signs this morning that point to Jesus truly being the Son of God. In order for us to make the claim that this was the worst day in history, we've got to see that He truly was the Son of God. And there's four things that took place in this text from verses 45 to 54 that I think point that out very clearly and can help affirm that for us. The first thing that you see is that there was a supernatural darkness over all the land from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. A supernatural darkness. I, I don't remember a day in my life when from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. it was dark over the whole land. What, what is meant by the statement over the whole land is argued by scholars. Maybe it means the whole land in the area they were. Maybe it meant the whole earth. We're prone to, to believe that it was the area that they were right there. That there was a spiritual darkness over the place. Why would there be this supernatural darkness as Jesus hangs from the cross? It's, it's noted that he was uh, crucified. The, the beginning of his crucifixion started at 9 a.m. And it was finished at 3 p.m. when he breathed his last but from 12 to 3, there was darkness over the earth. Let me give you some suggestions of what this could be. Maybe it's a sign of God's displeasure or sorrow as His Son hung from the cross. There are some who would make that claim. Maybe it was a picture of the darkness of sin as Jesus took the fullness of sin on Himself. There are others who would make that claim. But let me suggest to you what I believe the reason for this supernatural darkness was. Most likely, it was an accompaniment of God's wrath and divine judgment to be poured out on Christ on our behalf. I'm going to give you three passages that I, I... The Scripture over and over and over again shows us that darkness is a mark of divine judgment. And I'm just going to read to you a few of them, but you can read throughout Scripture so many uh, instances and times where this darkness is shown to be a sign of the judgment and wrath of God. Before I read those passages, let me just eliminate one other belief here. Some say... Maybe this was just a natural eclipse. Maybe this was just, uh, it, was, it was due. It was time for it to happen. But let me tell you, this could not have been caused by an eclipse because the Jews, they used a lunar calendar. And Passover always fell on the full moon, making a solar eclipse out of the question. I know we like to use our, our worldly wisdom and knowledge. We like to explain things away because we're kind of afraid of the supernatural. We're kind of afraid of miracles taking place or things outside of what we can comprehend. But this wasn't the case here. This was God's wrath and divine judgment being shown. So let me read to you. This is Joel chapter 2, 1 to 2. It says this, Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness 
and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. We see just one account of this darkness that precludes God's coming judgment. Isaiah 13, 10 to 11. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless God's coming judgment and the darkness. Zephaniah 1, 14 to 15. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day. A day of distress and anguish. A day of ruin and devastation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and again, thick darkness. That's what the text says there. If you read through the Gospel of Matthew three times, it talks of the darkness and gnashing of teeth that await those outside of Christ. And so I think that our best understanding of why this darkness was there is that the wrath of God was about to be poured out. And it was about to be poured out on the least likely of suspects. This supernatural darkness is showing that God's wrath and judgment are going to be poured out on Christ. If Jesus is not the Son of God, not the Messiah, then why would God pour out His wrath and judgment on a man who had never sinned, specifically just Him? You think about that darkness. You think about the wrath and judgment of God that's been reserved for those who are sinners, for those who have rebelled against a holy God. And we see here that Jesus in these three hours of darkness awaits the wrath of God to be placed on him. And we see as he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why would he scream that out? Other than the wrath of God coming upon him on our behalf so that we could be saved. Second thing that I think points us to Jesus being the Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is that the temple veil was torn from top to bottom. Look at verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. You see, people don't remember these things when they think about the crucifixion of Jesus. They remember that he was crucified, but they forget about these signs that took place as he was being crucified. Here we have the temple veil. Let me just give you a little background in case you don't know what this is. There was a place in the temple called the Holy of Holies where God's spirit dwelled. And once a year, the high priest could go in and make a sacrifice on behalf of the people. And if you read uh, in Leviticus, when when, uh, Aaron is is given this task as the high priest, you see that he has a, a little bell that is attached to him on his robe. You know why that was there? Because as he went into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God, if there was anything wrong, if he did not do everything perfectly to the standard God had for him, he would have dropped dead in an instant. He needed to be cleansed by blood. He needed to be covered as he came in. He needed to to have every stipulation. And if you read Leviticus, we see how detailed our God is about things that need to take place. I mean, detail after detail. It's hard to read through Leviticus because it's so pointed. And we see that God cares about even those small things. And so Aaron would go in and you know what? There would be a rope tied around his foot, just in case, whoever that high priest was, just in case that bell stopped ringing and that high priest dropped dead. You see, God's presence was there. And what do we know about sin and the presence of God? They're completely separate. They don't have any companionship. God is holy, set apart, 
perfect. There is no sin in him. There could never be. We see in Genesis chapter 3, as Adam and Eve sinned, what had to take place? They had to be cast out of the garden because they could no longer have fellowship and communion with God and walk with him in the garden. It was a part of the wages of their sin. You see, Jesus was cast out from God's presence so that we could enter. No one else's death could have torn that curtain for us so that we could experience the presence of God, so that we could be reunited to Him in relationship. We went from being forsaken to being forgiven. And Christ took on that forsaken for us. You see, sinners were granted access to God as that temple veil was torn. One thing I want to point out about the temple veil being torn, and I think this is, again, God is so specific and he, in, 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 he, he, in His divine providence, He knows what to say. It was torn from where? From top to bottom. Why was it torn from top to bottom? To show that it was no man who tore that veil, but it was God Himself. As Jesus breathed His last, God tore that veil. He wanted a relationship with us. He wanted us to be redeemed. He sent His very Son for that to take place. And I'm sure it was a great joy for Him to tear that curtain from top to bottom because of His great love for us. Third thing I want you to see is that there's an earthquake And that earthquake opens tombs. And what happens is resurrected saints emerge from the tombs. And we find them, verses 52 to 53, it says, The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after His resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Let me ask you, whose death has the power to raise others to life? There's only one. There's only one. What an amazing event. Not only does an earthquake take place, but then saints who had fallen asleep, our term for death, because we know that we're going to be resurrected, because we know it's only temporary, they were raised coming out of the tombs. The power of Christ to resurrect is foreshadowed here as we see saints being raised to life. And what do we await when Christ comes to gather His church? We await being resurrected in our new bodies. Who else has this power? No one. What what an amazing picture of the gospel that these men who were dead were able to come to life through Christ's death. He took the penalty of our sin, death, upon Himself so that we might have life. And there's no one else whose death could have raised others to life other than the Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of hordes. Fourth thing I want you to see, verse 54. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe. And they said, truly, this was the Son of God. Fourth thing, those in charge of the crucifixion and were guarding Jesus as he hung on the cross, believed. Who would you not expect to believe in this situation? The very soldiers who were in charge of Christ's crucifixion. You see, the centurion would have been over Christ's crucifixion. He had about a hundred soldiers under him. And as they guarded his body, making sure that no one could come and take him down off that cross, making sure that no one could come and rescue him from his death, he had to hang there and be tortured. And some cases, crucifixion lasted for two to three days as they hung there. They would break their legs to speed up the process so they would die. It was a slow and excruciating death. And those soldiers, the very ones whose job it was to guard the body and make sure no one could rescue him, to make sure that he died, 
and paid the penalty that was given to him. The centurion and those who were with him were filled with awe, and they declared, truly, this was the Son of God. Now let me ask you, when people say truly in the Scriptures, what do they mean? For sure. Truly. You remember Jesus when he teaches, truly, truly, I say to you, it adds emphasis, it adds power. They believed that truly this was the Son of God. And so we see these Roman soldiers who were the very ones putting Christ to death. And as he breathes his last and the earth shakes and the darkness is over the earth and bodies are raised to life, they make the claim, this was the Christ. The Roman soldiers recognized who this was and they felt the weight of the worst day in history. The perfect Son of God had died and it was at His hands. Or maybe it was at our hands. As we all know that no one could take His life, but He laid it down freely because it was the Father's will to save sinners like us. Let me wrap that first portion uh, of this sermon up for you. We can conclude from the evidence we see in these four points that the worst injustice the world has ever known produced the ability for sinners to be free from the impending wrath of God, reunited with a holy God, for those who were dead to be resurrected, and even those who were guarding Jesus as He was dying an excruciating death to believe. And we must ask ourselves, if this is the worst injustice, and yet we see such great things produced from the world's greatest injustice, the worst day in all of history, if God could use that for such great good, couldn't He use something like, say, the coronavirus for His glory and for our good? Couldn't He use the trials of this life, the hardships? Couldn't He use the things we complain about for His good, for His glory? Romans 8.28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to what? According to His purpose. Even the crucifixion of Christ, one of the worst things, the worst thing, was for good as God worked. So I want to give you four things in the second part of this sermon that I think we need to walk away with from this, from this text, as we focus on the crucifixion of Christ, as we prepare our hearts for Easter and the resurrection and the celebration that begins. Number one, first point of application, live free. Live free if you are in Christ. I want you to be real with yourself. Do you fear the wrath of God? Have you rested in the finished work of Christ on your behalf for salvation? Or do you find yourself constantly working to please God? When you sin, do you believe that He's angry with you and you have to earn back His favor? This morning, I want you to live free. Recognize this. The wrath of God was already poured out on His perfect Son, so that you could be forgiven and free. That darkness that was over the earth from 12 o'clock to 3 was a picture of the impending wrath to come. And if God has already poured out His wrath for your sin on His Son on the cross, will He do it again to you here and now? One day when you stand before Him, will He again punish and pour out His wrath for our sin? Or has that been poured out once for all? You see, as we look to Christ in the crucifixion and we see God's wrath poured out, as we hear Jesus cry out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, why have you forsaken me? We can say, I will not be forsaken, 
Because Christ was forsaken on my behalf. And because of my faith in Him, because He has taken my sin upon Himself, I have freedom. I can live free from the wrath of God. I don't have to tiptoe around scared of Him, but I come to Him as a son with authority to the Father. I have a freedom because of what Christ has done on my behalf. As we look to the cross, we see freedom displayed. God in His justice has poured out His wrath once for all who believe. So rest in the finished work of Christ. You see, the Pharisees couldn't do that. They had to earn it. The Pharisees had to prove that they were good enough, that they could do it. And you know what? They were whitewashed tombs. And Jesus had nothing to do with them. Let me tell you something. Rest and live in the freedom that Christ has given to us by taking the wrath of God upon himself. Second thing, don't waste your access. Don't waste your access. Jesus paid the ultimate price so that you could have access to the Father. The temple, the, 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 the veil was torn in half. And God says, come in. I don't have wrath for you any longer. You don't have to be afraid any longer. I've adopted you as sons and as daughters. The payment has been made. You're mine. Come in and fellowship with me. Come in and take part with me. That was the most expensive curtain tear the world will ever know as Jesus laid down his life for it. What are you doing with your access to the Father? Are you walking with God as Adam and Eve did in the garden before the fall? Or are you off getting into trouble with the serpent? Jesus did not die simply so that you could experience heaven one day. He died so that you could have life and life abundant here and now. That you could experience Him here and now. That you could have a relationship with Him here and now. What do we see Jesus doing every time He gets a chance? He's getting away and He's going to spend time in prayer with the Father. Because that's the true joy. That's the true reward that we get to be with Him and know Him forever and ever. And we don't have to wait till the day we die. It starts the day we believe and put our faith in Jesus Christ. We're saved. Pursue intimacy and deep relationship with the one who gave it all for you. Do not waste your access. Third thing. Live as though you will be resurrected. Live as though you will be resurrected. Matthew 6, 19 to 20 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. You see, we have a choice to make. We can build here and now. We can build this kingdom. We can build here on the earth where where things will, will fade away. They'll be gone. They'll turn to dust. Or we can build for a kingdom that is to come and we can build for our life after this one. Our resurrected life. We can invest in eternity and God's forever kingdom. Or we can live here as if this is all we have, as if this is our only life, and we can build up here and watch it all fade away in an instant. You know, in 2008, when the real estate market collapsed, there were a ton of suicides that took place in Mount Pleasant. I only know this because after I got there, uh, years and years later, I was told about it. Uh, Pastor Matt, who's now the senior pastor over there, was a police officer at the time in Mount Pleasant. And he said, you know, the newspapers, they they didn't even want to post it, you know, how, how many deaths there were. Because they had built everything here for here and now. 
And guess how long it took for it to be gone? A month, maybe two. That market dropped, right? We, we see it again with the coronavirus. You can spend your whole life building, 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 and in an instant it can be gone here. Live as though you're going to be resurrected. Live as though you, you truly believe and understand that this is not what you were made for. You were made for a relationship with God forever. When God created you, He created you eternal. You have a soul that's going to live forever. Whether in hell or whether in heaven, store up your treasures for the next life. Last thing, number four, taste and see that the Lord is good. You see, the centurion confessed that Jesus truly was the Son of God. Have you tasted and seen for yourself? Do you know it? Why did the centurion come to that conclusion? He had just watched Jesus die. Why would you watch him die and then confess truly he was the Son of God. Remember verse 43? If He is the Son of God, surely God will rescue Him. If He's the Son of God, surely He will come down off the cross. Instead, the centurion declares that Jesus truly was the Son of God after He breathes His last. You see, the true mark of His Son was that He would die freely for the good of others. Trusting the Father even unto death. You think about a little, a little child. They're standing at the edge of the diving board. They never swam before. They don't know what to do. And they're scared to jump in. And their father is there in the pool. And he says, come on, jump. And because it's their dad, and they trust him, and they love him, they jump off and they experience and see it's going to be okay. That's the mark of a true son. That they trust the father. That they're willing to obey. That they're willing to jump and trust in faith. You see, Jesus modeled, for that, modeled that for us perfectly. He trusted the father even unto death. He walked in faith trusting that the Father would raise him from the dead. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Are you willing to give up this life as Jesus did? To die to yourself as you trust in Jesus' righteousness and His payment for your sin? Do you trust that Jesus will come and gather His church? That He truly has the power to resurrect the dead? If you have not tasted, today is the day of salvation for those who will believe. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, I hope that uh, you will put these four things into practice as we prepare our hearts for this week, for the celebration of Easter and what Christ's resurrection means for sinners like us. As the Lord teaches you to die this week, this month, these next three months, however long, may you learn to die to yourself and live for Christ in a way that brings Him glory, honor, and praise. We model and follow the example that Jesus set for us so that all can see that He truly was the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank You for Your Word. And I thank you for the power that it has unto salvation. I thank you that it does not return void. And I thank you that we can stand on it as truth. And Father, as we looked to your son's death on the cross, and we see these signs, and we see his willingness and obedience to go even unto death, Father, I pray that we would follow him with faith, that we too would leap out and trust you as our Lord and Savior that we'd be willing to give up this life so that we may know you, that we may follow you. Change our hearts, God. Give us faith. Help us to trust 
in Christ instead of ourselves. Help us to build for your kingdom instead of our own. And Lord, may you be glorified and lifted high as we obey, even in the hardest of times, even in the toughest of trials. And may we look at these hardships and trials and praise you and thank you for them as we trust your leading, guiding hand through it all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.